Hello, congregation, family, and friends. I pray that all is well with you today. If you're watching this live, a, a blessed Good Friday to you. If you happen to be watching this on a rebroadcast or another day, I pray that your Good Friday was a blessed one. Earlier on today, I did send out uh, an older message that I had done regarding Good Friday. Hopefully many of you saw it already, but I wanted to send that out as like a prelude, just something uh, to keep us in mind of what today is, being Good Friday. But I want to look at a passage today in Luke chapter 23 that, to the best of my knowledge and in, in my experience, I don't hear preached on a whole lot. There are many things that we can talk about when it comes to Good Friday, many things. You know, the seven sayings of Jesus on the cross, that is always very popular. And, and rightfully so, because his, his seven statements are extremely important. We can talk about what happened between the two thieves, and that's what I preached on in an earlier message. But I want us to look at something that Jesus said and did on the way as he was carrying the cross on the way to Golgotha before he ever got there, before he ever said those seven statements that we all know so well. Jesus had a dialogue with people along the way. So I want to direct your attention to Luke chapter 23. And I, I want to just say up front, I, I thank all of you, those of you who tune in, those of you who share these broadcasts, those of you who um, get the alerts when I'm on. I very much appreciate your support and your prayers. So I thank you for doing that. And I pray that these broadcasts are a blessing to you. We're in Luke chapter 23. Now here's the situation now. Jesus is carrying the cross. He's on his way to be crucified. And we pick up the action here, if I can use that word, in Luke 23, beginning in verse 27. And I'm just going to read down to verse 31. I'm going to look at that small little section there. Luke 23, beginning in verse 27. And following him was a large crowd of the people and of women who were mourning and lamenting him. But Jesus, turning to them, said, Daughters of Jerusalem, stop weeping for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For behold, the days are coming when they will say, Blessed are the barren, and the wombs that never bore, and the breasts that never nursed. Then they will begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills, cover us. For if they do these things when the tree is green, what will happen when it is dry? We have to be able to decipher what Jesus is talking about here. Now remember, Jesus is on his way to be crucified. It's the final part of these trials and the sufferings that he's going through. And yet, he stops to say a few words to these women. So we have to determine, first of all, who are these women that are following Jesus? Who are they? Well, it says here, following him was a large crowd of the people and women who were mourning and lamenting him. These were not his disciples. These were not the women that had been following him in his ministry. They're further back in the crowd. These are the women that are along the road, lined up along the road with the crowds. And there are some women directly behind him that are mourning him and lamenting him. But why are they doing that? And, and that is the key to understanding what Jesus is going to say to them. We need to understand why they're lamenting. Why are they weeping? They are weeping because, are they weeping because of Jesus, the Son of God, is paying for the sins of the people? No. They are weeping and lamenting because of his cruel treatment, because he was going to be executed, because maybe they saw him with the miracles. Maybe they were part of the 5,000 or so that got fed. They know about Jesus. They know who he is, and they know he's on his way to be crucified, to be executed. They are lamenting. They are wailing, and they are upset that this is happening. But here's the thing that I need you to understand. They are missing the sign of the cross. They're missing the reason why Jesus is going. And he's going to address that in maybe somewhat obscure language, and I hope to be able to, to uh, enlighten you on that. Here's what he says. Jesus hears this going on. In spite of all the suffering, in spite of the fact that he's carrying his cross, it says here in verse 28, but Jesus turned to them. He turned to them and he said, daughters of Jerusalem, stop weeping for me but weep for yourselves 
and for your children. Let's take it right there. Jesus turns to these women who are lamenting, who are crying, who are weeping about him on his way to be executed by crucifixion. And he said, first of all, daughters of Jerusalem. That's one of the keys that we know these are the regular women within Jerusalem. These are not the daughters of Zion. These are not his followers like Mary Magdalene and so on. They're further back in the crowd. They're further back in the line that will be following Jesus that will wind up at the cross. These are women along the way. They're daughters or women of Jerusalem as he's going through the city on his way to be crucified. So he says to them, daughters of Jerusalem, stop weeping for me or don't weep for me. Why would Jesus say that? Isn't crying, isn't lamenting, isn't weeping when we see something incredibly sad, perfectly human? Isn't it? Don't you and I cry at something sad or if we see someone being mistreated or an animal be being mistreated or we hear sad news? Very often we cry, we lament, we weep, we're sad. But Jesus is telling them, don't do that. Stop weeping for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. That sounds kind of ominous. Jesus does not want them, and he's telling them to stop crying for him because Jesus is voluntarily going forward to his execution. He is giving himself willingly. He is doing what the Father has called him to do. He is finishing the assignment that he's been giving, and there's no reason for tears. Jesus is doing this voluntarily. If it was someone that was completely innocent, that's another matter. Jesus was innocent, but he was also taking on all of the sins of everyone who would believe on him. And the penalty was, part of it was crucifixion, so that he would die and rise three days later. So Jesus is saying, don't cry for me. He's doing the Father's will. He's doing what God called him to do. But he's saying, weep for yourselves and weep for your children. Wow. Why would God say that? Weep for yourselves and your children. The reason is in the next verse, verse 29. He says, for behold, the days are coming. They're coming in the future. And I'll tell you what that day is. The days are coming when they will say, blessed are the barren and the wombs that never bore and the breasts that never nursed. What day is Jesus talking about? He's talking about the time in the future. Now, remember, this is A.D. 33 when Jesus was being crucified. He's talking about the time of A.D. 70 when the Romans were going to come in and destroy the city of Jerusalem and oppress the Jewish people. That's what he's talking about. He's saying that day is coming. So you weep for yourselves and weep for your children. Why? Because some of these people who were here watching Jesus be executed were going to survive and going to live long enough to experience this oppression in AD 70 when the Romans came in. That's what's happening here. That's what God is saying. He's saying weep for yourselves and especially weep for your children because there's going to be Roman oppression. There's going to be murder. There's going to be oppression. Jerusalem is going to be destroyed and overrun in AD 70, and it was. And so he says here in verse 29, the days are coming when they will say, blessed are the barren, the wombs that never bore, the breasts that never nurse. Why? Because if you're a mother, now moms, if you're watching, imagine that you're living in AD 70 and you have children, young children. Would you want them to suffer or be imprisoned or be tortured or be killed by the Romans or an enemy coming into town? Would you want that? Of course not. None of us would. Fathers, if you're watching, none of us would, okay? None of us would. But here's the thing. Blessed are those who are not giving birth, who do not have young children, whose wombs have never given anything. Why? Why is he saying that? He's saying that because it would be better off that you don't have children that you're going to watch die or be oppressed or be tortured, be killed or be kept captive or become slaves. I certainly would not want to see my young children like that. I am sure you wouldn't either. So Jesus is saying, don't weep for me. Don't weep for me. I'm doing what God has called me to do. I'm redeeming all of those people and paying the price through their sins and for their sins as my Father has given me. I'm doing the will of my Father. So don't weep for me, but weep for yourselves 
and weep for your children. But even so, verse 29, he says the day's coming. That's AD 70. Blessed are the barren. They are blessed. Not because they're going to be under impression, because they're blessed because they don't have young children that are going to be captive or killed or taken away in some kind of way by the Romans. That's what he's saying. You're blessed if you're barren. He's not saying there's no blessing when you don't have children. He's saying in this particular point, because it's coming up, because it's coming up in AD 70, that was a short 27 years away, if my math is correct, or 37 years away from when Jesus was crucified. And many of these people would still be there. Look what happens in verse 30 as he goes on, as he's telling these women these things. He says, then they will begin to say to the mountains, fall on us and to the hills, cover us. That is a prophecy from Hosea chapter 10, verse 8, if, you, if you're making a notation here. Hosea 10, 8 talks about that so, at some point, the people are going to say, mountains fall on us, rocks cover us. Why? It'd be better to be crushed by a mountain, to be buried under the rocks, than to, than to suffer the oppression of the Romans. It would be better. Then they will begin to say to the mountains, fall on us. Literal mountains fall on us. To the hills, cover us, hide us, so they can't find us, so they can't torture us, so they can't overrun us, so they can't oppress us. That's what the people are going to say. The calamity is going to be so bad, so horrible, as Jerusalem is overrun and taken over by the Romans that the people would rather say, I'd rather have a mountain fall on me. I'd rather have the mountains cover me. I'd rather just be covered under the rocks. And then Jesus says this curious thing. He says in verse 31, for if they do these things when the tree is green, what will happen when it's dry? What? What is Jesus saying here? If these things happen when it's green, here's what Jesus means. If the Romans can take Jesus and crucify him while it's green, in other words, while Jesus is still here, while redemption is still here, while Jesus is still on this side of the grave, if the Romans can do this while it's green, while the tree is green, and when a tree is green, of course, it doesn't burn. You can't burn a green tree because of the moisture in it and so on. It only a dry tree burns. So Jesus is saying, if they do these things when the tree is green, if they're doing it right now while I'm still here before Jerusalem is overrun, before you're murdered, before your children are oppressed, whatever the situation is going to happen down the road, if the Romans can do this now while it's green, how much more is it going to happen when it's dry? When Jesus is long gone, when he's back to heaven again, and 37 years later, when the Romans come in, how bad is it going to be? But Jesus is saying, as bad as it may look now, because it, the tree is green, it's going to be infinitely even more worse when the tree is dry, because a dry tree burns just like that. It gets destroyed, which is what happened to Jerusalem. Remember, we read in other parts of the gospel where the temple itself, Jesus had predicted that not one stone would be left upon another. It would be totally leveled, and it was totally destroyed. These are the things that Jesus is talking about. So he goes back and he says, don't cry for me. Don't weep for me. You weep for yourselves because destruction is coming. This is a warning, not only to these people here, but we know that the Bible is a living word. The Bible is a living word. Thank you for tuning in today. God bless you. The Bible is a living word. Now, here's, here's something to think about, okay, because this affects you and it affects me. Yes, we see this, and this was told, Jesus said this in 2,000 years ago in AD 33. He told this to a group of women who are lamenting and crying, and Jesus is saying, don't cry for me. You better cry for yourselves. Well, guess what? Jesus is still talking to us right now, today, as you're hearing this broadcast. Jesus is saying, weep for yourselves and weep for your children. Why? Let me just share a couple of thoughts with you. First of all, those of us who are parents, and I'm already a grandparent several times over, praise God. But those of us who have raised children and have even grandchildren, they, we're all born into a fallen, sin-cursed world that by and large has rejected Jesus, rejected the Bible, not interested in Christianity. Some 
there's actually a good number of people don't even believe that Jesus is the Son of God or that he even existed. They don't believe this book. They refuse to listen to the truths in this book. They run from it. And so for those of us who have children and grandchildren, we see what's happening in school. We see what's happening in the music scene and the, the record industry and movies and television. And it continues to get worse and worse and worse and worse as things are spiraling downhill. Prayer is kicked out of school. The Bible is kicked out of school. Crosses are coming down. Ten commandment monuments are being destroyed from in front of courthouses. All these things have been happening. So as bad as it was in AD 70 when Jerusalem was overrun, I submit to you that it's ultimately and infinitely worse today because we have more and more people who are unbelievers. We only have a small remnant that are actually going to be saved. But we have to raise our children and our grandchildren in a world and a society that by and large has either rejected Jesus or tried to repress the gospel message. I'm under attack almost every day. Satanic attack. But I, I was on here last night and someone had put up something really horrible because I dare to preach the gospel. I dare to stand here on the front lines and preach the word of God and people will come against you. They don't want to hear the truth. Well, that's between them and God, isn't it? But Jesus is talking to us today. He's talking to you and he's talking to me. If you're not saved today, if you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, the Bible says that today is still the day of salvation. Today is Good Friday. When you think about Good Friday, we're not thinking about sales at the store. We're not thinking about a long weekend. We're thinking about what Jesus did on the cross. Had he not gone on to cross the cross, had he not paid for our sins, we'd have no eternal life. Simple as that. None of us would have the guarantee of eternal life. Eternal life. None of us would be going to heaven. Zero. Nobody. But because Jesus went through with the will of the Father and he saw it all the way through, there is hope for eternal life. I pray that you're saved. I pray that your children and your grandchildren know Christ. I pray that parents and grandparents, that you are raising up your children in the fear and the admonition of the Lord, that you are raising them up to understand who Jesus is and why he's so important and why we must have him as our Lord and Savior. You know, Easter time or Resurrection Sunday is one of the events during the year that uh, Christians show up more. They show up at Christmas. They show up at Easter. We call them twice a year Christians. I used to be one many years ago. You just go for the important days. You don't go all the time. You just go for the important ones. And so this weekend, there may be many more people in church to hear the message. But how many of them will come back next week? How many of them will be there next month? I've seen it year in and year out. People come and then they go away. And, there's, and you can't get them back. Now, I'm not turning this into any kind of a social commentary. I'm trying to show you that what Jesus said to these women 2,000 years ago, to weep for yourselves and weep for your children because calamity is coming, it is still here. Calamity is still here. And until Jesus comes back and until he and, and this world is destroyed, until this world is destroyed by fire, as Peter tells us, and a new heaven and a new earth is built, we have to live in a world and a society that by and large doesn't want anything to do with Jesus or Christianity or the Bible or salvation or accountability for sin or repentance. They don't want that. It's, that's too hard of a message. It's too self-sacrificing of a message. They'd rather hear a feel-good message with all kinds of positive talk, or better yet, no message at all. You see, if you don't acknowledge God and you don't feel an obligation to acknowledge God, then you have nothing to repent for, do you? If you can avoid God, you can avoid Jesus. If you can avoid the cross and what it means, you don't have to be accountable because you don't believe, because you've chosen to reject it. That does not mean in any way, shape, or form, that you're not going to stand before the judgment seat of God and be judged for your actions and for your sins. That's going to happen. It's going to happen to everyone. You can deny it. You can try to hide from it. You can run from it. But it's going to happen because God decrees that it's going to happen. I want us to look at this passage here. When Jesus says, don't weep for me, 
I don't, I don't cry for Jesus. I'm, I'm sad at how he was treated, but I don't cry for him because he was crucified because Jesus gave himself up. He gave himself up because that was the will of the Father. Do you remember when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane? Do you remember when he was in agony and his sweat was like great drops of blood? And he said, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. But nevertheless, Father, your will, not my will. Well, God the Father's will is that Jesus would pay the penalty for all those who would believe on him. And that included crucifixion in the most horrible way to die. And when it was all done, Jesus said what? It is finished. And he gave up the ghost. He bowed his head and he gave up his ghost. He gave up his life voluntarily. Nobody took it from him. He gave it up. And so are we to weep for Jesus? No, but we're to weep for ourselves, weep for our neighbors, weep for our friends and our family members and our co-workers and our neighbors. We have to weep for them, especially those who we've told the gospel to and they've rejected it. We need to weep and pray for those who either have rejected Christ, have rejected the word of God, have no interest in Christianity, have no interest in heaven and hell, no accountability for sin. Those are the people we should weep for. Our own family, our own children, our grandchildren. What is going to happen in another generation or two if Jesus doesn't come back with the way things are going, with the way Christianity is being oppressed, with the way the Bible is being squeezed out of school and prayer out of school, and you can't have free speech if you're a Christian now. It seems to get worse and worse and worse. What's going to happen in another couple of generations? What's going to happen with our children and our grandchildren if we don't raise them up in the fear and the admonition of the Lord? If we don't raise them up, to stand firm on the Bible, stand for Jesus Christ, stand for something, stand for Christianity, stand for the Savior that gave his life for you and for me. What's going to happen? The same oppression that happened here is the same thing that's going to happen now. It's happening today. It'll happen tomorrow. It'll happen 10 years from now, 100 years from now, until Jesus comes back. But we have a remedy about that. We can pray and we can witness and we can be bold and we can stand on the front lines for Jesus and say enough is enough. Christianity is the true religion. And I don't like using the word religion. It's a faith. Christianity, Jesus Christ is the son of God. You have a choice. You can believe it or you cannot believe it. And here on this Good Friday, you can choose to believe that did Jesus go to the cross? Did he die for my sins? Yes or no? Did he pay the penalty for my sins? Am I clean before God because of what Jesus did? Yes or no? You have to answer that for yourself the same way that I do. And here we are on this Good Friday, if you're watching this live, and we are considering what Jesus did for us. And he's telling these daughters of Jerusalem, stop weeping for me. You weep for yourselves. You weep for your children because bad things are coming. And it did in AD 70. But Jesus is talking to us right now. Are you hearing me? This is, this is God's word. That's nothing to do with me. This is God's word. Jesus is saying, weep for yourselves. Weep for your children. Weep for your grandchildren, mothers, fathers, those that I'm talking to right now. Somebody's hearing this message. Make sure that you're raising your children correctly. Make sure you're raising them in godly things, in Christian things. Make sure they understand and know the Bible. Make sure that you're saved and that they have every opportunity to become saved and be part of God's kingdom. Because if they do, then Jesus died for them as well. I, I weep for my children and grandchildren that don't know the Lord yet. They've all been told the gospel, but it's up to them, you see, if they're going to accept Jesus or not. I can't twist their arm. I can't make them do it. They know what I do for a living. They know that my calling is to preach and teach the word of God. They know that. They don't tune in. They don't listen. But that's between them and God. And my heart breaks for them. That's who I weep for. My children and my grandchildren and my friends and, and other family members and co-workers and those people who don't know Jesus. They don't know what I know because either they've rejected it or maybe they were never told. It's, it, it, it can be a very upsetting thing when you think about it, weeping. Jesus says, don't, don't weep for me. God, he's doing exactly what God the Father has told him to do. And he completed it. And when it was all over, he said, it's finished. It's done. Jesus paid the penalty in the past. 
for all of our sins right now and all the sins we are going to commit. One and done. It is finished. I pray that this message has been some blessing to you. If it has, please feel free to share it. Isaiah 55, 11 says, God word, God's word does not return void. It reaches whoever it reaches. Glad to be back. Thank you. God bless you. God's word will never return void. It reaches everybody he intends it to reach. So if it reached you today, if it blessed you today, if it's helping you today, share it with someone else. Also, I would encourage you to be a Berean. Acts 17.11, our church family knows this. Acts 17.11 says that Bereans were more noble than others. If they weren't better, they weren't smarter, they didn't have more money, they didn't have more advantages in life. You know what it was? They searched the scriptures daily, Acts 17.11 says. Why? Because they wanted to make sure that what they were hearing was the truth. You owe it to yourself as well as I owe it to myself. Every time we hear the word of God preached, whether it's on television, radio, internet, a church you go to, Wherever you hear the word of God preached or taught, you owe it to yourself to go back and study the Bible for yourself. Don't blindly accept anyone because there's a lot of things that are taught incorrectly. There are some things that are just taught flat out wrong for deception purposes. They twist things around to make the Bible say something that it doesn't say. So you owe it to yourself. And I owe it to myself. And every time I hear a sermon, every time I hear a lecture or a Bible study, I go and check it out for myself because I want to make sure that what I'm hearing is the truth. Please do the same. You owe that to yourself and to your children, especially if you're teaching them the word. You need to know what the word says accurately to teach your children and grandchildren. Lastly, we have a website. And some of you have seen it. You've commented. And I'm, I'm grateful. We have a website, livinginharmonyministries.org, livinginharmonyministries, all one word, .org. On that website are different things that we do as a ministry to help individuals, from preaching and teaching and Christian counseling to other things that we do for church bodies. We come in and we help churches. This is a walk of faith. It's, it's a ministry that God has raised up. And I would just ask, if you haven't seen our website, stop by and take a look at it. If there's something that we can do to help you, we are here to serve you. We're here as God's servants to serve you. So if we can help you, please feel free to get in touch with us there. And if it's not for you, that's okay. If you just want to share the website with someone else, because maybe you know someone that needs Christian counseling or someone that could use a, an in-depth Bible study of some kind. Whatever we can do to help, we're here to help you. And would I ask two things of you before I say goodbye? Number one, would you please pray for this ministry? We are standing on the front lines for Jesus. We're not going anywhere. We take a lot of hits. We take a lot of grief. I'm under attack all the time. And any of you that preach and teach the word and try to live as a, as a God-glorifying Christian, you know what I'm talking about. When Satan and his imps come and attack you spiritually, it wears you out. It, 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 can, it can totally destroy you. Well, Satan is trying to shut this ministry down. He's trying to shut my mouth. And, and he's doing everything that he can to do it, but he hasn't won and he's not going to win. So would you please pray that we would remain strong and faithful and on the front lines, that God would word my mouth and help me to learn his word more and more so that I can come here and also in local churches and preach and teach the word of God. Would you do that for me? And lastly, would you please pray that God would raise up supporters to help us financially? There's a place on the website that you can give if God leads you to make an offering or give a donation to this ministry. You can also do it through Facebook Messenger for those who are on Facebook. I am not a huckster out here. I don't have anything to sell. I'm not begging you for money. But if the Lord leads you to support this ministry so that we can stay out here and we can keep doing what God has called us to do, then we would humbly and we would gratefully accept it. But that's between you and God. In either case, I hope that you'll keep coming back over and over and over again. And uh, there's all kinds of videos that are posted all the time. If you see one of my older videos, please feel free to just share it. Just share it. Let's get the word out there. The more people that hear the word of God, the more people will see in heaven with salvation. 
I want to thank you for being part of the broadcast today. I can't always see all of the comments here because I am simulcasting, okay? So I can't see everything. If you've asked a question, I'll see it later, or maybe you can private message me. I apologize for anyone who may have asked a question or something, but uh, with these multiple cameras, it's hard to see everything. So I apologize. I'm not ignoring anyone. Have a blessed Good Friday, and we'll talk soon. Thanks for being here. God bless you.